Carbon dioxide is a necessary and valuable component that plays an important role in an exponential list of systems. One of these systems involves the exploitation of carbon dioxide by plants, in particular C3 and C4 plants, which we will discuss in this video. The yellow arrows indicate solar energy produced by the sun. This energy may not penetrate the troposphere and therefore reflects back to space. Solar energy can, however, penetrate the troposphere and re-radiate as thermal radiation, indicated by the red arrows. Thermal energy is absorbed by atmospheric greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and re-radiated in all directions. Our Earth's atmosphere, the troposphere, is composed of a diverse range of gases such as the predominance nitrogen and oxygen, as well as argon, carbon dioxide, water vapour and many others. Although carbon dioxide appears to represent a much smaller contribution, it has a massive effect on the Earth's atmosphere and in turn our weather patterns, food security and general well-being. Certain research initiatives have arisen to study the impact of higher atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide upon modern life. One such project is the Free Air Carbon Dioxide Enrichment or FACE experiment which has been created to further study the effects of high levels of CO2 on plant growth and physiology. These projects as well as our research indicate that the rising levels of CO2 will not only cause a change in climate but also an extreme change in how plants grow and absorb the gas. This has an extreme impact upon food production and agriculture, which will in turn influence all areas of modern life, having profound sociological ramifications upon societies internationally. This idea has transformed over a number of years. In 1712, the Industrial Revolution changed manufacturing processes from handmaking to machines. Coal was required as a power source for machines and large amounts of carbon dioxide were released to the atmosphere. Between 1824 and 1861, two physicists introduced the concept of the greenhouse effect and its outcome respectively. In the year 1897, research led to the conclusion that coal burning in the industrial age enhanced the natural greenhouse effect. It was believed this might be beneficial for future generations. Following this, in 1900, Further exploration saw the ability of carbon dioxide to absorb infrared radiation and concluded that it was a greenhouse gas. By 1927, carbon emissions had reached 1 billion tonnes per year. In 1938, it was discovered that the temperature had risen over a century and research in 1955 established that a doubling in CO2 concentrations would increase the global temperature by about 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. In 1958, Charles David Keeling ventured to Mauna Loa Volcano in Hawaii and fabricated her series of measurements on atmospheric CO2 levels over a four-year period. Keeling discovered a gradual increase in CO2 concentration, something not known previously, as the first person to confirm the accumulation of atmospheric carbon dioxide, Charles has become a world leader in research on the carbon cycle and the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. By using precise measurements, he produced a data set now known widely as the Keeling Curve. All living things breathe. When we breathe out, some of this carbon is released back into the air as carbon dioxide. Some of this carbon dioxide is consumed by plants and used in photosynthesis to produce growth. <sighs> Plants are affected in different ways depending on the environmental conditions. Conditions such as increasing levels of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere is raising the average global temperature, but also positively impacting the growth of plants. But how? How do varying levels of carbon dioxide affect plant growth? This is the question we want to answer. In order to do this, we must first start from the beginning with photosynthesis. Photosynthesis involves the production of glucose and oxygen from water and carbon dioxide by leaf cells. Leaf cells are full of organelles called chloroplasts, which contain chlorophyll, a pigment that absorbs and traps light energy. Next, water enters the leaves. 
transported by xylem vessels from the roots, the carbon dioxide then enters through pores called stomata, located on the underside of the leaf. Glucose from the reaction is then transported from the leaf in order to be used as energy. The chloroplast itself is a double membraned organelle containing stroma bound thylakoids. The thylakoids convert trapped light into chemical energy contained in NADPH and ATP, the two molecules used in the second stage of photosynthesis, the Calvin cycle. This cycle occurs in the stroma of chloroplasts. Carbon dioxide is captured by the chemical ribulose biphosphate. Six molecules of carbon dioxide enter the Calvin cycle, eventually producing one molecule of glucose. Carbon dioxide enters through pores or doors called stomata, located on the underside of the leaf. When carbon dioxide enters the Calvin cycle, it eventually produces one molecule of glucose. The plant usually makes more glucose than it needs immediately, so the extra is stored until the plant needs it for growth or for food when it is too dark to perform photosynthesis. Furthermore, the higher levels of CO2 will not be uniform in its effects on plants, affecting some more than others. There are two main types of plants. C3 plants, which make up the majority of all the plants on Earth, can undergo photosynthesis while their stomata is closed, but are less efficient photosynthesizers. And C4 plants, which live in hot, moist or arid habitats and are very efficient at photosynthesis. But within the period of 25 and 32 million years ago, there was a revolution in this photosynthetic process. Some tropical grasses produced a four carbon product instead of three at the first stage of photosynthesis. Scientists called this C4 photosynthesis. The first carbon compound produced in C4 plants is a four carbon molecule. In C4 plants, carbon dioxide is first incorporated through the carboxylation of PEP by the enzyme PEP carboxylase in the mesophyll cells. PEP carboxylase is a more efficient enzyme than Rubisco and accounts for the environmental tolerances. The C4 acids that are produced from the carboxylation of PEP are transported to the bundle sheath where carbon dioxide is re-released and then fixed again through the Calvin cycle. The carbon dioxide affects how the gas and vapour diffuse through the stomata. The whole of the stomatal pores decrease as carbon dioxide levels increase, causing a parallel decrease in the rate of water loss. The rate of both reactions depends on the O2 to CO2 ratio, and therefore with increased carbon dioxide levels, the carbon fixing process in photosynthesis is favoured in the C3 plants, with little or no effect on C4 plants. Overall, all plants under high CO2 should lose less water due to the stomatal effect. However, C3 plants also fix more carbon due to the rubisco effects, which increases their growth. In relation to our experiment, we have four specimens. Two of our examples of corn and wheat was grown in a bottle, which blocks off the oxygen. This disrupts the normal rubisco process, as the oxygen to carbon dioxide ratio levels was changed. The bottle acts as the cell while the lead acts as the stromata. The other two specimens were grown as normal, with no disruption to affect its growth. The results of the experiment shows that increased carbon dioxide level influenced the growth of plants. The two specimens that have normal atmospheric carbon dioxide levels had a higher biomass than the two specimens with the decreased carbon dioxide levels. Through our research, and research conducted around the world, it is evident that the rising carbon dioxide levels have a detrimental impact upon the global environment overall. However, in particular, it increases plant growth, and although the warming of the planet has many detrimental impacts, Further research in industries such as agriculture 
may offer beneficial consequences such as higher yields in plants, offering the possibility of improved food security. The full extent of these effects are still unknown.